that. And now it's recording, just like that. And the entire thing gets recorded very easily. Yeah. So you might want to do that someday. So the talk breaks up into three parts. Uh, first, I'm going to show you some tables that appear in a paper that uh, we uh, submitted and have been accepted for ANTS in San Diego this July. Uh, then I'll talk about very briefly about how to find all elliptic curves attached to a new form G. So John Bober, who is giving the next talk after me and is not here because he's either trying to get some more sleep or preparing his talk, um, so I know it wasn't written yesterday. Uh, we'll talk in a lot more detail about two, assuming he shows up and um, he wakes up. And then three, I'll talk about finding new forms. So that's Hilbert modular forms. So first, some tables. Um, and to emphasize, the source of these tables were a bunch of calculations that were made as part of an REU at University of Washington last summer. And some of the REU students are here right now. Raise your hand if you're one of the REU students here. Cool. So, and there's one other one, Ashwalk, who's a, apparently a night owl. He's not here right now. Um, but we knew from the summer <laughs> REU that he's a night owl. I'm amazed to see you. Thank you. Um, so you can find all the data from the tables at this URL, for example. Um, it's a GitHub repository. And you can find um, some code that was used to make the t some of the tables. You can find actual tables here. And there's one that Noam showed during his talk yesterday. Um, I, don't I, have to, I don't know if I can do it through here. Yeah. So this is a nice PDF, um, which looks like Cremona's printed book. And it has, it's similar to Cremona's book, except the curves are over Q square root of five. They're over F instead of over Q. And also, uh, we were lazy, and we didn't put anything for the isogeny class column yet. But other than that, they're basically the same. And they even replicate some silliness, like giving the order of the torsion subgroup rather than the structure, which is stupid. It should really wish it could be structure. No offense to you. I mean, you had <laughs> printed page constraints. So. There you are. So, so we, we've replicated your every mistake. <laughs> yeah. Um, and you can see the range of the tables. They, they go on, there's, there's a lot in here. Uh, you know, going up to, they go up to norm conductor 1831, which doesn't sound very impressive compared to, say, uh, John Kermona's current tables of elliptic curves over Q, which go up to conductor 236,000 now, and thereabouts. So nonetheless, just to emphasize, there are a lot of curves here. Look, at, there's quite a lot of uh, that level. Um, so there's quite a bit to do here, and this keeps going on. And this will go all the way up to 1831. And the thing that distinguishes 1831 is it's the first time that you see a 2 in the rank column. All other entries in the rank columns for all the curves of smaller conductor have rank 1 or 0. So that's the reason that we stopped there. There's another stopping point I'll talk about, um, which would be the first curve of rank 3, maybe. We don't know yet. Um, and I'll talk about that at the end of my talk. OK, a quick remark, um, which did come up in uh, Richard Finch's talk yesterday. So if E is an elliptic curve over F, then you can take the coefficients and hit them by a certain automorphism, and you'll get another elliptic curve over F. And in our tables, we include both of the curves. For about, I don't know, two-thirds of the summer, we didn't include both of the curves. We would have only one of the two conjugate curves. And it turns out this is a little bit confusing. Um, and because you're, you're const it's more confusing than you might think when you want to make systematic tables of everything. And it's really not that hard to include both of them. Um, so we just decided in everything I'm going to talk about in the tables I just showed you, you have a curve and you also have its conjugate. And thus, of course, those two are isomorphic, in which case you just include one of them. For example, if the curve starts out defined over Q, then its conjugate has exactly the same defining equation as the curve itself. So there's no point in including both of those. Um, so anytime I give you a count of you know number of curves with some property, I'm not modding out by this um, equivalent by this um, equivalence. And it's really just I mean we tried both ways and it's just, it just causes confusion, it causes more both ways cause confusion. But this, 
but having only half, roughly half the curves causes more confusion. Okay, so here are some tables. Um, first, this is a count of the curves that we found, or, and it should be all of the curves, of norm conductor 18, up to 1831. Um, I'll say a little bit more about whether or not we have all the curves in a moment. But um, here are the number of isogeny classes of curves of rank zero, the number of isomorphism classes of curves of rank zero, and so on. So um, there are roughly equal number of isogeny classes of ranks zero and one, but far more isomorphism classes, as you can see. And there are two curves of rank two. There's really one curve and its image under that automorphism that I mentioned. And also you see the smallest <coughs> norm. So the first curve of rank zero, that's really that's the first curve in the table. It has norm conductor 31. So there's an ideal in the three <coughs> integers of the field F that lies over 31. And its norm, the norm of that ideal is 31. That's what I mean by this. Um, the second, or the first curve of rank one is of norm conductor 199, and the first of rank two is of norm conductor 1831. And I think uh, Lucina, in his PhD thesis about 10 years ago, had found all of these rank record curves already. He didn't know that they were the rank records, but it turns out they are. Um, dividing the curves up into isogeny, or into having an isogeny class of a given size, so there are 498 isogeny classes that have size 1, so curves that are isolated in their isogeny class. Um, 530 where you have just two different curves in the isogeny class, et cetera, et cetera. And um, unlike the case over Q, there, is an iso there are isogeny classes of cardinality 10, and we see that happening three times in our data. And I think Noam uh, proved in his talk yesterday that this happens infinitely often. And all the of the three, maybe, I don't know. Um, that's possible, given the range. I didn't ask that question and answer it to myself. Probably. Um, and notice that everything happens already up to 199, and you don't see any new sizes up to 1831. And as I mentioned in my talk on Friday, for all we know, these are exactly the sizes that occur. There might not be any other cardinality sizes. Um, and I don't think Noam suggested otherwise in his talk. So he certainly made it so that you should wonder um, by emphasizing that you can have surprising stuff that you don't notice early numerically. OK, rank data. So this is just a more refined um, table, similar to the one I showed you a moment ago, which um, I think mainly Andrew O'Connor made, which gives the number of curves of each rank up to various bounds. So it's you know, still a very, very small amount of data. But you can see that in this table, uh, there's you know, roughly an equal number of isogeny classes for each rank, except at the beginning there's a bias towards rank zero. Oops. That's already sort of mellowing out. Um, probably if we made this table a lot bigger, as is the case over Q, there would suddenly start being a bias towards rank two, which would seem weird. And then that would eventually go down. I want a similar table for isomorphism classes. OK, here's um, degrees of isogenies. So how many curves have no isogenies at all of prime degree? Um, none. So there are 498 isogeny classes of such curves. And there are also 498 isomorphism classes of such curves. Because those curves have um, one curve in each isomorphism class or isogeny class, sorry. Um, there are more isogeny classes with a few isogeny, and of course, the number of isomorphism classes is even bigger, because each of those curves that admits a two isogeny um, is isogenous to some other curves. So that's the biggest here. And then you have three, five, and seven. And in the range of our tables, we don't see any 11 isogenies or 13 isogenies, or most interestingly, we don't see any 17 isogenies, um, even though, as Noam explained in detail yesterday, there are 17, there are infinitely many different um, curves over F with, an, with a 17 isogeny. So they happen, they just have larger conductor. Um, remember the number 498 when I show you the next slide? Uh, which I just noticed this when I was looking at the talk this morning. 
There are 498 curves with no isogenies. And strangely, um, I copied this table out of our paper. We claim that there's only 296 isomorphism classes of curves with no torsion. So that seems to be a contradiction because um, if you don't have any torsion, I'm sorry, if you don't have any isogenies, then you definitely don't have any torsion because you can take a torsion point and mod out by it. So I think there may be a, a mistake here. I think it's more like 700 and something. I did a quick calculation with our actual tables. So this table's wrong. Anybody notice that? I just noticed that like a few minutes ago. Um, I was suspicious because 296 seems kind of small, but um, it's definitely inconsistent with the previous table. So we're going to meet at lunch and sort out the referee report on our paper. I really hope the referee noticed this, but we'll see. Um, otherwise, we'll need to figure out, we'll have to fix this. So there's something wrong with the torsion table. Um, aside from that, though, there are these nice examples of various torsion groups appearing. And um, as I mentioned, Friday, the one, and as no mentioned, the, the one new one that appears is Emod 15 z So that one does not appear over the rational numbers. And you'll see that it appears exactly once in the range of our tables. Moreover, it appears exactly once. This is the blood curve right here. It doesn't appear any more. And um, comparing with, so this comparison is suspicious given that I know that the first entry is wrong. Um, but at least I can show you the number of isomorphism classes with various torsion structures over Q up to 1831, so for the same range. So um, Z mod 2Z occurs quite a lot, as it does over F, and trivial group also occurs a lot. And then you know, others that occur less, and as a quick consistency check, notice that Z mod 15 doesn't occur at all, and that never will. All right, so those are the tables over Q and F at the same time. And then finally, the last table I'll show you. So um, each of these tables are the sort of thing that somebody could independently reproduce if they were to do a similar calculation, and then they would get numbers. And I would be very happy if they get exactly the same numbers. Because you know, when you, when you compute a big data set using a lot of different techniques and people, um, and then get one little number at the end, which is you know, the number of things with some property, it's, you know, it's a pretty, it's like a, I don't know, it's, it's like computing a hash of a file. If anything goes wrong, you're going to get the wrong answer, probably. Um, but one thing with the number of curves up to given bounds and so on, the total number of curves we found, um, John Voigt and uh, uh, Stephen Donnelly <coughs> had computed the number of iso isogeny classes of curves, at least, up to the same bound and got exactly the same number. So there's some good consistency with the work that they have. Um, much of which predates what we did. So here's a final table. This was an enormous amount of work to make. And um, one of the points of this table is it illustrates that not only did we compute the curves, but we computed all of the invariants except the order of Shaw appearing in the Birch and Swinner to Dyer conjecture, and then solve for the order of Shaw. And here's the table that one gets at the end. Um, your confidence can be increased by noting that the this table doesn't contain any numbers that aren't squares of positive integers, um, but I don't know. I don't know. I think so, but I don't know, actually. And so Ashwath made this table, and Ashwath is not here at the moment, so he might know. I don't know. But um, his description of how he made the table doesn't inspire extreme confidence that it's perfectly correct in me. but. Um, um, usually, I don't know, if I made the table, I would have also have lower confidence. But nonetheless, there's something you can verify. You know, if you're very interested in finding a curve over this field with Schaffer's take group of order 9, then you can definitely take this curve and look. And so we have tables that illustrate various Schaffer average take groups. Um, this is the first, the smallest norm conductor where one of these occurs. Uh, many of these are not, are somehow accounted for by isogenies in that there is an isogeny of the same degree, or a, a degree dividing the order of the shot. Um, I didn't check to see whether that was the case for all of them, but there's quite a lot. You can see something about the distribution. Um, so, oh yeah, yeah. Except for in one case. So the, for the very first curve of norm conductor 31, the first one in the table, that's actually the order of shot. It really does have shot order one. 
And this is a, a very non-trivial thing that um, Ashwath and I spent a couple of weeks on. But you can apply, so the, in this case, the conductor is square free. And you can apply, um, in fact, it's a prime, the, one of the primes line over 31. So you can apply results of Zhang, which give you um, the fact that Sha is finite for this particular curve. Uh, for this curve, the rank is 0. The analytic rank is 0. Sha is finite. And you can explicitly compute the height of a Hegner point after making a trace of quadratic imaginary extension of f on this curve. It's hard to compute the Hegner point itself because um, unlike the situation over q, you don't have this nice situation with modular symbols and cusps and so on, and re a really easy uniformization. So it's kind of hard to just directly numerically compute the Hegner point. Nonetheless, Matt Greenberg in a paper, I think, did compute one of these Hegner points, although I think it was wrong. Yeah, he did compute one in, um, in some paper, and he has an elaborate and powerful algorithm to do this sort of thing. But a different approach is that you can simply compute the height of the Hegner point using John's formula. Who needs the actual Hegner point? You just need its height. Um, so for, for those purposes, you, we computed, I guess, the height of the point, and then via some other method, you used to search and find points on the curve. I mean, you're really just trying to verify something about DSD rather than trying to find a Wardell Bay group, which is the usual or classical application of Hegner points. So you compute the height of the point, you find a point without height, and you're in a rank one group, so you know what point it is. And so um, Ashwath did that after spending a lot of time staring at John's formulas and found um, the Hegner point, and then it didn't match up with, unfortunately, Matt's in his paper. So he wrote to Matt, and Matt's like, argh. <laughs> Not sure what exactly happened, but um, but that's typical. I mean, this stuff is so hard to get right computationally. Theoretical stuff's easier. There's <coughs> many consistency checks sometimes. Um, in any case, he uh, computed the Hegner point. Then there's an argument that's in um, basically in a paper of Gross, which really goes back to Kalevog, in which if you actually explicitly have the Hegner point and you know it's indexed in the group of rational points over whatever field's defined, you can get an explicit upper bound on the order of Shaw, not just that Shaw is finite. And so he, he did this, and the explicit upper bound was like, um, I don't know, power of two or something. So it's a multiple of the order of Shaw. And then you do an explicit two descent and see that two doesn't divide the order of Shaw. And so combining all this, you get that Shaw is trivial. And so he did this for the one curve. And in that case, we really are computing the shaft barrier decay group, not just its conjectural order. So BSD is true for at least one curve. Um, that there, there, are, um, there are other examples of curves over F for which BSD is known to be true, the full conjecture, but they're kind of cheats. We can take a curve defined over Q and such that we know BSD for the curve and its quadratic twist, and then the only thing that could go wrong is at 2, and you could just do a 2 descent to deal with that. But this curve of norm conductor 31 um, clearly doesn't come by base change from a curve over Q, otherwise it's 31 would be a perfect square, which it visibly isn't. Okay, so these are various Shaw's, and it would be, an, um, I think, a very difficult project to compute the actual order of Shaw for far more curves um, in our data. Uh, I don't think there's any real hope right now to do this for curves, say, this conductor is a perfect square, but as long as there's a prime that exactly divides the conductor, it's reasonable that one should be able to do this using um, the algorithm that I just outlined. And this would be exactly analogous to what Robert Miller and Michael Stoll and me and other people did over Q. Okay, so now part two of my talk will be a very quick summary of, uh, it's like basically, well, I'll talk about finding all of the elliptic curves attached to a new form G, which will strongly motivate you to go to John Bobber's talk in a few minutes. Bobber's talk, sorry. Okay, so first, a few background remarks um, that are really just a specialization uh, of some remarks that were made in Lacina Dembele's talk. So um, modularity is really useful to making systematic tables, either having a modularity theorem, if you're the sort of person that wants to know that you know, all the things that you've written down are complete and definitely right, or just believing modularity, if you want to know that, if you want to, if you it's just as good to just believe it, because then you also, quote, know. If you have faith in modularity, that helps as well. So one way or the other, this is a relevant guiding principle. And the idea, which I think uh, people are pretty convinced of nowadays, in light of what Wiles did and so on, 
is that there's a bijection between L functions of elliptic curves over F, where F in fact could be any totally real field, and L functions of rational Hilbert modular new forms of parallel weight 2. And in fact, this bijection preserves the conductors. So if you were to put elliptic curves over F of conductor N and new forms for a specific level of N, then you get a bijection. And these are, I emphasize I put Q here, these are rational new forms. If you allow the new forms to be to have coefficients in a bigger field, then the abelian, then you should replace E by an abelian variety of GL2 type, where the dimension of the abelian variety is equal to the degree of the field generated by the coefficients. And that's, exact, that's exactly the um, conjecture that Asina described in his talk. You have a question, though? Yeah, how do you distinguish infinite triangles? Because infinite triangles are not really the same thing. It will have a different L function. The point counts are different. The, um, yeah, it's just a completely different L function. Yeah. Nope. Nope, it's different. <coughs> so what happens is the L function you get by, um, the L function is different, I I think. What? It's not different? It's the same over Q. Yeah, but it's, but it's not, this is not over Q. E, I think e over F. Oh. There's definitely confusion, but they're different. Um, no. The AP are di is different. Okay. Yeah, the other product is different. Yeah. I don't agree with this one, but yeah, okay. Not even isogenous. That would be. Or, no. They're not even defined over Q. You have two curves. They're not. They're defined over F. They are not isomorphic over F. They are not isogenous over F. But it is the case that there's an automorphism <coughs> of F that takes one to the other. And some people in the room are claiming that the L functions of these two curves are identical. And another person. No, it's probably wrong because I'm in the front of the room and I can't think. Yeah, I it's claiming that they're different. No, I, I think there's some reason why what you're trying to describe. Right? Yeah. So these two curves are also defined over F and for some extension of F. Mm -hmm. But they are not isomorphic. Like no. <laughs> yeah, they're never they're not even isomorphic over Q bar. Yeah, this is J invariant. Yeah. Their J invariants are conjugate. So yeah, they're not they're not twists in any sense. They're conjugate. <coughs> yeah. Then, then, <laughs> say anything about their functions. <laughs> I'm doomed. <laughs> what do you mean, say anything about them? But they don't exactly. They they conjugate. Yeah. How about if I just? They, that is true. But they're, they're indexed differently. Yeah. I mean, so L, F, S. These numbers will differ for the two curves, but these numbers will be the same. So for one of the primes, so if you have you know, two split primes, sorry, if you have 
two primes that are above a single prime at the bottom, you have two different Euler factors for different primes, but the norms are the same. So you're right, when you multiply the two Euler products together, you'll end up getting the same thing. Uh, but if you take just one of, if you, you sort of thought of the Euler, if you thought of the factors as being indexed by primes, then they're different. So you're right. Aha! That's a good point. John claims that the completed L function is different. I don't know if that's true, though. Nope. That was a good point. Aha! Uh, but you're right. But the key thing is I have to restrict. I didn't make it clear. So I had an n on the right hand side and on the left hand side. If I put an n on the left hand side, everybody would be happy. But if I do not put an n on the right left hand side, I'm going to piss off a lot of people. So. Okay. <laughs> sure. <laughs> All over. I'm going to put it in. I want to. It's driving me crazy. <laughs> Plus, my talk's kind of short, so I'm trying to find a way to make it longer. <laughs> Maybe Ashwath will show up. Hey, there he is. Good. I really hope I didn't break the tech. There you are. I don't know if anybody's pissed off, but everybody should help. <laughs> oh! <laughs> Great. Okay, one, one uh, final remark. So, Richard Taylor visited UW to give some talks, and I asked him about the extent to which this is proved, and he pointed out that Mark Kisson and Toby G have done a lot, or G, whatever I've done, a, which is it, G or G? G. G. Toby G have done a lot of work on uh, modularity over 12 of the real fields, and you can kind of read off pretty easily from what they've done, that if you put in a hypothesis on the mod 3 Gower representation, namely that if you're restricted to f adjoint zeta 3, then if that's absolutely irreducible, then you get modularity automatically. And then there were various, um, you know, he sees uh, students and so on that might be able to extend this to more general situations. Um, but this was kind of the, you know, concrete result that you have. And also for many other real quadratic fields under very, under basically no hypotheses, he expected that, except for some finite list of families where you have to do an explicit calculation, similar to what was done on various modular curves in the case of Fermat's theorem, um, you should be able to get modularity. So one is close to having modularity on a case-by-case, -case, on a field-by-field -field basis, except for certain really, really bad fields, such as F, that contains square root of 5, which makes things harder. Nonetheless, um, I think it would be really nice if, and I mean, if this were a workshop, I would suggest it would be really nice if somebody could just do a nice, simple algorithm to check this condition, and then check it for the range of our tables. That was an obvious problem that we didn't address at the RU, but given the collective power of the people in the audience, um, it shouldn't be difficult to come up with an easy way of checking this. How do you check if uh, the mod 3 representation of a curve over f restricted to that group is absolutely irreducible? So if you're bored. Okay, there you are. So I suggest that as a problem for today. Okay, um, I'm going to uh, prove a disrespectful theorem, or a theorem that gets no respect. Namely, um, I don't know, this came up in Lucina's talk, and I felt like maybe my Heckling wasn't clear enough. So, um, so here's a theorem, I claim. If you assume the modularity conjecture, then there is an algorithm that takes as input a Hilbert modular new form, and I emphasize that as <coughs> rational Fourier coefficients, and outputs one of the many elliptic curves in the, um, that has the same L function. Okay? And here's the algorithm. Uh, first, you compute all of the rational new forms in this space, and once you have them all, you can observe, just by looking, how many coefficients you need to determine one of them. So this is an important step, but as you'll see. So you compute all of the new forms in the space, and you'll find that, oh, if you just take the first five a sub p, then that determines one of the new forms. 
Now, simply enumerate elliptic curves over F. There are countably many, so just choose some way of enumerating them. Um, any way you like, as long as it is an enumeration, so you'll hit every curve eventually, or any given curve will eventually get hit. In particular, B curve that we know exists by our assumption, E, or the A curve which has this property, namely that LES equals LGS, such a curve exists by our hypothesis. So you'll eventually hit it, and when you hit it, you'll observe that its conductor, and we can compute the conductor using Tate's algorithm, is N. And moreover, the AP for PF for the first five A sub P um, agree with the A sub P of G, and therefore you have to have this equality. And any time you found a curve of conductor N that, for which this wasn't the case, you would have found that one of the A sub P for the first five A sub P didn't match up. So pretty, um, pretty silly, but it is an algorithm. There's a big difference between algorithm and algorithm that's really fast. And uh, a number of should know this well because of um, Hilbert's 10th problem. So um, if you want to challenge, I think that a similar argument works for abelian varieties of GL2 type. But you kind of do some tricky, funny things in there to, to actually make it work. Because it's pretty straightforward to enumerate elliptic curves. But when you consider abelian varieties of GL2 type, it's a little harder because um, you have to somehow uh, characterize them as being of GL2 type when you enumerate. Uh, it seems like a very Lenstra style problem. How do you, you know, enumerate all abelian varieties of GL2 type in some way? What? There's a similar conjecture, probably similar results. Um, and as Lucina pointed out yesterday, there is. Um, over the rational numbers, you know that all abelian varieties of GL2 type, GL2 type means, uh, for simple abelian varieties, means that the endomorphism ring tensored with Q is, e is a number field of um, a degree equal to the dimension of the abelian variety. Um, you know that they're all modular. And um, over other fields, you have a similar conjecture. And this fact that they're all modular, there's a beautiful paper of Ken Ribbit, which proves that if Serre's conjecture is true, then you get modularity of all abelian varieties of GL2 type. So he reduces it to Serre's conjecture. And it's um, roughly an elaboration of an argument of Serre. I highly recommend you read that paper if you haven't already. So, um, but as Cremona remarked yesterday, this algorithm is not respectable. Um, it's not the worst possible thing to try doing, especially if you first do a big enumeration and then just look and see what you get. Because this will, in fact, this disrespectful algorithm will get at least roughly half of your curves. Um, depending on how far you look. Okay, um, here's a, an outline of John's talk, I hope. Um, so just some of the many possible ways you can approach the problem of finding some elliptic curve corresponding to a new form. One is you can naively enumerate, as I just pointed out. You can do a sieved enumeration, so just enumerate, but um, try to win back a little bit of respect by imposing some conditions. Um, you can search through torsion families. So as uh, was pointed out in John's talk, if it looks, by looking modulo P, at which you get a complete information about from the Hilbert modular form, that your curve has an L torsion point, then there is, in fact, a curve in the isogeny class with an L torsion point. This is kind of like the isogeny thing that you pointed out, except strangely with the isogenies, it's not the case in complete generality that if it looks like you have an isogeny, then you actually do. But I guess usually that's the case. Um, but he gave this infinite family of counterexamples where um, it looks like you have an isogeny mod any prime. Well, in fact, you do mod any prime, but you don't have one for the elliptic curve over f. It's kind of shocking and disturbing. And you can try it. You can actually type in the family from this talk, and you'll get curves with this property. It's really annoying. But, um, uh, but in any case, that's one thing you can search through. You can search through congruence families. So if you um, know a curve e prime, because you found it already, and you want to find another curve e, and you know that the model representations are the same, um, if L is, say, 5 or 7, or, um, at least maybe 11, definitely 5 and 7, Tom Fisher is very good at doing that. So, um, so it might be that this curve E has enormous coefficients, or it's very hard to find, but the curve E prime you already know. And you just happen to notice that congruence. Um, you can twist, you can, Cremona, there's the cremona lingham algorithm, which, um, assuming you can compute mortal vague roots, will find all curves with good reduction outside, outside some finite set of primes. So you just run it and sort of fake trying to find mortal vague groups and take as many generators as you can find and 
just keep running it, looking at curves you find, and if it'll, it's finding curves of good reduction outside of n, but if you find curves that actually have conductor n, you might as well output those as you go, and if you find your curve, hey, you found your curve. Um, I don't know of an analog of the Sturm bound, where if you uh, know that a certain number of coefficients are correct, then, I mean, if you know a certain number of coefficients, then you know that you've definitely found the right curve. But if you're finding all of the curves of a given conductor, which is what we're typically doing, then you don't need the stern bound. Is there a stern bound yet for Hilbert modular forms? Hilbert modular forms, people? Yeah, I think he did. I just don't know it. Oh, right. Right. Give you a good thesis problem. Um, okay, let's see. And then uh, Noam Elkies has a powerful idea that involves using the lambda invariant, which I understand from John, and John is implemented in Magma. Um, you guys have used this effectively. Didn't you send me an email yesterday about this? So, okay. All right, well, we'll see. Pay attention to John's talk. All right. And then um, there's another problem, moving on from this, and so leave way more about finding all you soon enough, um, or finding an E. Another problem is finding all E. So you found one of the E's that has the right L function, but you need to find all the E's. And for that, you enumerate all the curves in the isogeny class. And for that, um, use an algorithm of Bill Array, which will tell you a set of possible degrees of isogenies. And then if you want to find, if you have a prime L and want to find all L isogenies, there are formulas that are, um, I think, describe nicely in David Cole's thesis. They're not due to him, but they're, uh, they're due to Velu, but it's Velu. But um, you can find them in Cole's thesis and in Sage, of course. And just to give you a sense of what the Bill Array algorithm looks like, it's not, um, so here's the code in Sage that uh, Ashwa wrote. And you can see that you define some polynom univariate polynomials. You do a lot of calculations of traces of Frobenius of A sub Ps in various places, substitute polynomials evaluated at things into other polynomials evaluated at things. Um, something with B, not Z. And that's, so the code's, that's pretty much the whole code right there. There's nothing deep anywhere in here. And then at the end, you do something with um, putting together various sets. So basically, he produces various sets in a fairly elementary manner, such that if you take the, the union of all these sets, then they give you all possible isogeny degrees. Intersection. Okay, it's even better. Intersection. Great. Yes. Nope. How? Oh. Really? Huh. But you can tell that it's not. Re you can tell it's not reviewed because uh, there's no doctors. By the way, if you did want to do it now, um, just to illustrate. <laughs> In GitHub, you can click on a file and then just start editing it. So you're saying that. It should be Bill Array with a, where is it? Yeah. Oh, crap. All right, never mind. I don't want to do that. But there's a way to just click on it and start editing it. And you have to click Edit at the top. Okay, now finally, um, I'll talk for the last few minutes about how to find all the new forms um, of a given level, which I haven't talked about at all in any of my talks. And really, I'm just going to summarize in one slide the um, algorithm that Lassina Dembele gave in his PhD thesis um, a decade ago and described in a paper from 2005. And um, it's really a combination of two ideas. One is that you can use the Joppy Langdon's correspondence to reduce the problem of computing all the Hilbert modular new forms, or really Hilbert modular forms, let's say a, a module of the Hecke algebra, to the problem of computing with right ideal classes in an order of level n in a certain quaternion algebra. So it's the sort of approach that um, Brandt and Heiser and, and many, many other people have exploited to great effect David Cole um, over the years. And you combine that with, um, Dembele has, has a clever observation that um, in this particular case at least, the right ideal classes are in bijection with elements of, of P1 of R mod n modulo a certain relationship. So, Computing the right ideal class is just amounts to computing this P1, and then you mod out by some uh, easy to mod out by relation. 
So now let me explain the algorithm in one single slide. So first, um, be aware of the Hamilton quaternions. I mean, really, this is the quaternions from Hamilton. Uh, the only difference is that the base field is Q root pi, is F now, instead of Q or R or whatever it was for Hamilton, probably R for Hamilton. So consider the Hamilton quaternion algebra. Inside of there, there is a maximal order. There it is. I'll call it S. I'm calling R the ring of integers of F. And S is this maximal order in the Hamilton quaternions. Now, um, P1 of R mod N is simply the equivalence classes of pairs of co-prime numbers A comma B in R mod N. Modulo the action of R mod N star. So, pretty straightforward. Um, some finite set, you can easily enumerate its elements, et cetera, and work with it. And, uh, I mean, for example, when N is a, is a prime that's split, R mod N is just a, is FP. So it's just P1 of FP. Then for each prime that divides N, see the, this quaternion algebra, FIJK, one very nice thing about it is that, so it has to be ramified at two places, right? And there are two places where it's definitely ramified, which is the infinite places, because R adjoint IJK, the traditional Hamilton quaternion algebra, is not split. It's uh, actually a quaternion algebra. It's uh, not a matrix algebra. But the two infinite places, FIJK is ramified, and it's not ramified any of the finite places. So over Q, it was ramified at two, but that ramification at two disappears when you go up to Q root five, when you go up to F. So for every finite prime that divides the level of interest, you have an isomorphism between FIJK tensored with the residue field FP and two by two matrices over FP. Or more generally, you have an isomorphism between the uh, thing tensored with QP and the two by two matrices over QP. So the quaternion algebra is split at all of these primes. And so you just fix some completely arbitrary choice of isomorphism. And after you fix that choice, then that defines an action of the units of S star on P1. A unit of S star gives you an invertible matrix mod P, and hence it acts on um, P1. Finally, as I mentioned, you have jockey Langlands, which more or less says that you have an isomorphism between uh, the complex vector space on this finite set, namely the orbits of P1 of R mod N modulo the action of S star, and um, not two by two matrices, but Hilbert modular forms of weight P2 on gamma not N. So the left-hand side is a um, very easy to compute, conceptually at least, finite dimensional vector space. And the right-hand <coughs> side is this mysterious space of Hilbert modular forms. So the left-hand side's nice. And you don't even need to know much algebra to compute the left-hand side. I mean, it's just, like, if N, again, if N is, a, is, say, one of the split primes over 31, this is just P1 of F sub 31 instead of cardinality 32. You're modding out by the action of S star. So S star might be scary because it's in, infinite, actually. It contains R star, and R star is the uh, group of units, which is infinite. But um, since we've already modded out in, in the definition of P1 by R star, the R star part doesn't matter at all. And the only, this S star, uh, the units of this maximum order, also includes something called the octonian group, which has order much smaller than infinity. It's a finite group, and you can just list explicit uh, explicitly list all of its elements, and really you just look at the action of S star through the octonian group on there. And so you just have this little group that's acting on this finite set. You take an element, you spin it by the action of this little group, and you get an orbit, and then you just do that with the next element, and you'll easily enumerate um, equivalence classes. And then finally, there's a description of the action of Heckel operators on this set. Namely, if you take one of these elements of P1, a representative X, the action of the Heck operator TP is the sum over um, alpha times X, where alpha are various elements of, um, of X. They're elements with reduced norm pi P. Here, pi P is a fixed choice of positive generator of P. So you fix such a thing. There is a choice of a generator because we're working in a PID and, um, and so on. I guess the strict, strict class number one. So, uh, so there you are. So you get an action of Heck operator. It actually is somewhat subtle to find all of these alphas, but um, in theory, you could just do some stupid search until you find enough of them. But in practice, you want to do something involving LLL or, uh, or fast. You want to do some sort of fast enumeration, finding short vectors, and so on. Um, so there's some subtlety in doing this efficiently.
But the really funny thing is that once you do this, once you compute the alphas with norm phi p, you just save those once and for all, and you can use them for computing with any level. They don't, they have nothing to do with the level thing. And you don't have to do any extra algebra for each level. Like you don't have to figure out what a new maximal order is or anything for the level. Notice the only way in which the level plays a role is in P1 here. The P1 of R minus plays a role nowhere else in anything we do. Which is uh, one thing that got Lessina very excited. And now some remarks. If you want to implement this algorithm and have it be fast, um, it's kind of obvious, but it's critical that you can compute in P1 of R mod N very, very, very quickly. So just to illustrate this, um, John Carmona had a student who implemented P1 of uh, no, the ring of integers of a number field modulo an ideal, and it's in Sage. And uh, Ali and I sat down at a coffee shop and decided to implement um, computing P1 of R mod this prime over 31, the very first example. So let's say n is this prime of norm 31. And we spent a couple of hours and we implemented computing um, not only P1, because that was you know like two lines of code, but then we implemented dividing up into orbits and doing everything else. And it took like, I don't know, one minute to compute a heck operator. And it was entirely a minute attribute. I mean, the algorithm that we use under the hood is exactly the same as the really, really, really fast algorithm that I use now. But the implementation was just using all this generic slow code. And um, basically, we just deleted, delete all the three varies and the quickly, and you get what we had. And it took, a, I don't know, like a minute just to do the very first example instead of a few microseconds. And um, what, what we did over this, the month or two after that was just think more carefully about how to compute with P1 of R mod N and with um, S star or with the octonians and all the other objects that are involved here. And we got it to be at least, I don't know, 1,000 or 10,000 times faster. So, so um, just to give you a sense of the speed, you can take any level at all of norm conductor up to 200,000, say, and explicitly compute the set P1 of R mod N modulo the action of S star in about two seconds or less for any such level. So, and once you get that, then you can start computing heck operators on it. So it's very, very fast to construct this. And why is it fast? Um, basically, we just um, wrote from scratch code that uses basic C data structures, lots of static instead of dynamic memory allocation. And we represented P1 of R mod N. Um, you do a lot of putting things in, um, in a canonical form, checking equivalence, et cetera, in order to do these various operations. So what we do is we represent P1 of R mod N as the product of P1 of R mod PI to the EI, where PI to the EI are the prime power factors of N. So by, in every step, always keeping that representation, you completely reduce to the problem of efficiently checking equivalence and enumerating elements of, R, of P1 of R mod PI to the EI. And that's really easy. Um, because a complete set of representatives are the elements of the form 1B, or A1, where A is divisible by P. It's really easy to list all of those. It's easy to put an element in that form. And if your underlying representation of elements is via this isomorphism here, um, when you have an element, you just component-wise can put each of its components separately in that form. So you can easily reduce to canonical form, enumerate, whatever. So it's super, super fast for everything. Um, sort of painful to implement. It's not in stage yet, but it's, we're working on it in this track ticket right here. OK, so now um, what's next? So uh, I guess the next conference that some of you might be at that I'm going to is the 2012 Math Research Community in Snowbird, Utah. Is anybody here going to be there? One, two, three, four, five. Okay, cool, lots of people. Um, so the project I'm going to have my project group work on will be to compute an enormous number of these Hilbert uniforms and gather arithmetic statistics about them because the conference is supposed to be about arithmetic statistics. And um, here's one concrete goal. So here are the rank records. The first three were in Lacina's thesis. The last three are from Noel Melkis, because he has he's Mr. Rank Record for elliptic curves. And um, he pointed out that if you take this curve of conductor 163 over Q, I think it has rank 2, but its quadratic twist by 5 has rank 1. So together you get rank 3. What? Oh, sorry. The other way around. Yeah, that's a good point, because... The first curve of conductor, or rank two definitely has conductor bigger than 163. So the other way around. 
the curve over Q has rank one, the quadratic twist by square root of five has rank two. So combining those two together, you get uh, rank three. So that's the first, that's the smallest known conductor of a curve of rank three over Q root five. 26,569 doesn't seem like a completely unattainable goal, given that I told you that you can at least compute the space of Hilbert modular forms in about two seconds to conductors that are 10 times as big as this in norm. So um, one goal that we'll have is to see whether or not that really is the first um, step. So see if somebody else can, can uh, knock Gnome out of this spot. Sorry. Um, then the next one might be this. It's a little bit suspicious given that this one isn't prime. Um, so we'll see whether the first of norm conductor, or the first curve of rank three has prime conductor or not, or curves over F. Okay, and then, uh, so that's one concrete problem. And now, finally, I will end with an epilogue or a prologue, which um, here's an email I sent to John Boyd a little over a year ago, um, which I said, I'm planning to try to say something about these sorts of things, mainly that I'm ignorant in each case, um, but I'm curious what thoughts you might have. So John in the back sort of launched me in useful directions regarding computing things over Q root five. And this kind of enumerates um, a big list of ideas for things one can do where you decide to replace Q by F and then start computing with elliptic curves. So I'll just kind of very quickly go down this list and say something about what has or has not happened. So a stein watkins style search, so as I mentioned in my colloquium, you can make an enormous table of curves. Um, let's see, so Joanna Gasky and Ali Dinas sort of started in this direction, worked out a lot of background details to figure out how to efficiently sieve, but no, as far as I know, no real code to efficiently do this has been implemented and or been run. So there aren't any actual resulting tables, but they have good estimates for how to do it and how much they should be able to do, right? So um, this, this is halfway, Halfway thought about. Um, Elke's approach, I'm not even sure what I meant by that. Um, I think it's the lambda invariance thing. So it's been worked out by some people. Um, I won't go through everything. So fast computation of AP. Uh, so if you have an elliptic curve over Q, the best way to compute the ace of P is not to use Perry, not to use magma, it's to use a program by Drew Sutherland called Small Jack. That has the fastest implementation of computing a sub p, all the a sub p up to some bound. Um, it's not the best program if you want to compute a single a p for p that's enormous, then Perry is probably one of the best for that. But for a whole bunch of a sub p, this code is extremely good. Unfortunately, it's only over q, or in fact, that was the case until I started complaining to him a lot <coughs> in the summer, and he rewrote his program so that it works over for hyperelliptic curves of, I guess, genus less than or equal to three over number fields. So I don't know what the release status of that is, but definitely he has written code, um, and there's at least a beta release. So you can compute A sub P, lots and lots of them very efficiently for hyperelliptic curves over number fields. Um, congruence number. So um, you can define analogs of the modular degree and the congruence modulus and so on in the context of Hilbert modular forms. Um, Ali's been looking at this uh, some and working on coming up with an algorithm to compute these things in practice, especially the modular degree, kind of following um, uh, Shizu Takahashi's thesis. Uh, enumeration of the isogeny class, I was really scared of this and worried that it would be incredibly hard to do in general because you'd have to generalize Mazur or something. But fortunately, Villaray, uh, John Kimono pointed out Villaray's paper and that just completely deals with the problem in particular cases. Although uh, there are you know, ways to, there are lots and lots of, at least it deals with it in the sense that it's possible. But to make it really efficient, there are lots of additional improvements that we made. I think you have a PhD thesis student who is maybe working on this, was working on this, finished working on this. He kept telling me about such a student. But, yeah. Okay, okay. Um, computing the root number. Uh, I don't know, you can use Dotchett's search program and try both root numbers and see which one works. And that does actually work pretty well. Computing the torsion subgroup, no problem. Uh, computing Kamigawa numbers, Tate's algorithm. Computing all integral points. Uh, I guess Rado and somebody else ported some Magma program, Sage, and then some other people did it at the Women in Sage Days conference, and it works, but it's kind of slow because it's right. A lot easier to make code like this fast if you make it wrong, as we've discovered repeatedly. Um, hitting Kodaira symbols, Tate's algorithm, Zeros, Dotsitzer, and Rubenstein's programs do in fact both work over uh, 
any field, as we found. Um, it's really, really useful to test the functional equation for whatever L function you're looking at, because then you can, even if you don't know exactly what's going on, you can try a few possibilities and figure out what the right one is. Um, a notion of canonical minimal wire stress equation. So I haven't said anything about that at all, but um, for elliptic curves over Q, there are, if somebody says the minimal wire stress equation, they're confusing you or they're lying because there isn't a the minimal wire stress equation. But if you restrict the, if you um, restrict A1, A2, and A3, the first three of the uh, A invariants of the curve, appropriately, so um, to be really small in an appropriate sense, then there is a unique minimal wire stress equation. This isn't true over all number fields. Um, there is something that is similar that is true over uh, certain number fields. And Andrew Ohana, who's in the sweater right there with the hoodie, um, has thought a lot about this and come up with uh, various good notions of a canonical minimal wire stress equation under certain hypotheses on the number field. And um, we can ask him about that. So a lot of thought actually has gone into this. So for example, when I was showing you those tables, those PDFs of elliptic, you have a comment question. Oh, when I was showing you those tables of elliptic curves, um, the wire stress equations were in a canonical form. So you could take a random elliptic curve of norm conductor less than 1831, run a, a program that Andrew wrote, get a minimal wire stress equation out, and it would match for sure the one that's in our table. Okay, so that's nice that you have kind of a canonical form that you can put things in. But you only have that once you decide on how you're going to do this. It all basically amounts to dealing with um, powers of the unit and the discriminant. And figuring out what the residue classes should be and so on. I don't know, do you want to say anything? There's not really time. For it. You've written it down. Um, what else to say? Drawing pictures, I don't know what. Um, computing the regulator and the height pairing. So there's code in Sage, I think uh, various people wrote that computes the height. There's some weird precision issues with it and that you have to kind of bump the precision up from the default to get the right answer more than like one or two digits in some funny cases. So if you use Sage, watch out. Magma seems to uh, just get the precision right from the start. Um, so that needs to be fixed, in fact. Computing Hegner points, we did compute one. So uh, norm conductor 31. Uh, did you do any more than that one or just that one? Yeah. Okay. Um, computing the cardinality of Shaw, same thing. This has been done once. Um, images of Galois representations, kind of related to that. I mean, Gnome's talk is about that in a sense. Um, though, and Nathan's on Friday. Um, and one thing that I haven't said anything really about, but uh, it would be nice to extend as much as possible what I just talked about to modular doing arrays attached to corporate modular forms. So enumerating them, computing things about them, and so on. Okay, so that ends my talk. Okay, are there any questions that I'm not about to ask? Yes, John. Where, which it are you talking about? Um, both, I think. Both. So um, they're all ranked. So for all of them, we did a two descent using Simone's two descent program. Using Simone's two descent program. Um, and for all of them, we computed the all function. So at a bare minimum, definitely we have the analytic rates kind of tabulated. Um, and there's no issue except for the one of rank two about whether it's correct, about whether the analytic rank is correct. So the one of rank two, to verify that the analytic rank is correct, I think technically we would have to compute the Hegner point, which we didn't do. Um, or at least get some bound on a denominator coming from Hegner points, which we didn't do. Um, so. I think that in all cases we computed the rank full so I don't think we found any counter examples to see them. Uh, okay. Um, yes, no. Did we look at what? Sorry. Oh. Uh, why? What do you mean? Oh, right, right, yeah, I, I know what you mean. Yeah, of course. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, for every... So, Noam is alluding to a subtle question, which is, if you consider all elliptic curves over Q and all points on them, 
then they have a, there's a set of heights of those points. Some of them are zero, some of them are not zero. What's the smallest height of the smallest point of any curve over Q? You can ask a similar question over F for any field F. We did not even, I don't think, I don't remember looking at that question at all. But, um, so, no. But that would be a really good thing to look at because then we could have the rec we could have the record. <laughs> um, and you could compare it to whatever the record is over Q. Okay, uh, next question. Yes, John. Um, I came to the conclusion in the Bristol workshop that I've personally given up on labels. <laughs> so, no, I'm, I think that I personally have, but there are, I, I think I'm the only person that's given up on labels. So you can find many um, people who, like Andrew's thought pretty hard about different labeling schemes and um, has some, I think, good opinions about how things should be done. Um, from now on, whenever I make databases, I'm just going to give raw data that defines the thing I need. And when I refer to them in papers, I'm now just, I'll use whatever label I want in the paper, and I'll have a table which gives the actual wire stress equations at the end. So. Because I'm, I mean, labels just make, make it busy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So there's there's some truth to that. Yeah, that's my answer. Yeah, LMFDD labels. That's you. I'm not supposed to show this thing. <laughs> yeah, so anyways, the, these new labels will appear here somewhere. Yeah, they're in here. Oh my god. <laughs> so notice that there's the new LMFDD labels. Ooh, look at that. Watch out. But there's a dot, so you'll know <laughs> the difference if you look closely. Yep. Uh, any other questions or comments? So let's thank the speaker again. <laughs>